You may remember the 28818 rule, the law used to describe how electrons were arranged around the nucleus of an atom. This, unfortunately, is a lie, a useful lie that was relevant to Bohr's model, but no longer accurate according to Schrodinger's model. So how do we really communicate the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus of an atom? In order to do so, we need to understand some more of Schrodinger's model and rules supplemented by some of his contemporaries. Firstly, like the 28818 rule, which sorts Krypton's 36 electrons into four shells, Schrodinger's model also sorts electrons into shells, with his first shell being occupied by a maximum of two electrons, and his second shell occupied by a maximum of eight electrons, very much like the 28818 rule. But his third shell holds a maximum of 18 electrons, and his fourth shell holds a maximum of 32 electrons. To draw Schrodinger's atom in a PowerPoint slide and capture all the details of his orbitals will require a lot of space. So please bear with me and this crude sketch of a Schrodinger atom that only serves to show you how his shells and orbitals work. To allow for labeling, I will only show a cross-section of this model Schrodinger atom. At the center of this atom, is the positively charged nucleus. Further out from the nucleus, you'll see this dotted green line, which represents the boundary of this atom's first shell. Between the nucleus and this boundary is a 1s orbital, which can only fit a maximum of two electrons. The red shaded area is a measure of the probability in finding any one of these two electrons. If you traveled further away from the nucleus, you'll reach a second dotted green line representing the boundary or limits of the second shell. Within this second shell, you will find two types of orbitals. A 2s orbital a region just outside 1s, and can occupy a maximum of 2 electrons, and a 2p orbital, a region just outside 2s, that can occupy a maximum of 6 electrons. Of course, when you venture past the boundary of the second shell, you will enter the third shell. We're just outside the second shell is the 3s orbital, a region just like 1s and 2s that can occupy a maximum of 2 electrons. And if there was enough space, I would add the 3p orbitals, which like the 2p orbitals hold a maximum number of 6 electrons, as well as the dreaded 3d orbitals, regions within the third shell that can occupy a maximum of 10 electrons. Of course it gets difficult showing you the other orbitals relative to each other, given the amount of space I have on a PowerPoint slide, but I hope you get the idea. So just to recap, the electronic structure of Schrodinger's quantum atom involves shells and orbitals. The first shell contains only one orbital, a 1s. The second shell contains two orbitals, a 2s and 2p. The third shell contains three orbitals, a 3s, 3p, and 3d. The fourth shell contains four orbitals, a 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. It is important to note that f orbitals also appear in the 5th, 6th, 
and seventh shell. They are regions within the atom that can occupy a maximum of 14 electrons and are the final type of orbital worth noting. And if you're wondering how many shells an atom can have, the conventional answer is seven. And while these are the shells and their respective orbitals available for electron filling, this is not the exact order in which these orbitals are actually filled. This is Krypton has 36 electrons. If we wanted to show Krypton's electronic structure or configuration, we would need to draw this and then fill each orbital accordingly. This diagram embodies three rules proposed by three of Schrodinger's contemporaries. One of these rules, called the Aufbau Principle, was developed by Wolfgang Pauli and Niels Bohr. And their rule was, orbitals and or suborbitals of lower energy must be filled first. Earlier in this video, P and D were referred to as orbitals, which is true, but you are not told that the P orbital is made up of three sub-orbitals, P1, P2, and P3. While all D orbitals are made up of five sub-orbitals, D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. Suborbitals are degenerates of the same orbital. Degenerate, meaning of the same energy value or level. Another important note is the order in which these orbitals and suborbitals appear next to the increasing energy arrow. The orbital that requires the least amount of energy for an electron to fill is 1s. And the orbital pictured in this diagram that requires the most amount of energy to occupy or fill is 5p. Further to this point, although 4s is in the fourth shell, it gets filled before 3d in the third shell. This is because it is easier to fill the 4s orbital compared to filling the 3d orbital. Or in other words, a filled 4s orbital is more stable for an atom than an unfilled 3d orbital. And once 4s is filled, this orbital's distance and consequently energy level lowers to something more stable relative to the 3d suborbitals. The next rule is that each suborbital can only fit a maximum of two electrons at a time. This rule was made famous by Wolfgang Pauli alone. Believe it or not, electrons spin, and spinning, or moving charges, produce a magnetic field with a direction. Two electrons next to each other, spinning in opposite directions, will produce two magnetic fields that kind of attract and thus minimize electrostatic and magnetic repulsion within the atom. Two electrons next to each other, spinning in the same direction, will produce two magnetic fields that oppose each other and thus maximize electrostatic and magnetic repulsion within the atom. The pairing up of two electrons spinning in opposite directions also prevents the atom itself from having a net magnetic field.
and the third contemporary to Erwin Schrödinger was Friedrich Hund, who proposed rule number three, which states, every orbital in a subshell must be singly occupied with one electron before any one orbital is doubly occupied. And all electrons in singly occupied orbitals must have the same spin. For example, it's easy to place three single electrons in the three vacant orbitals of subshell P. But pairing any one of these three electrons with a further electron will require more energy and thus pose more difficult, as you've now increased the amount of electrostatic repulsion within this set of 3p orbitals. Now let's return to Krypton and use our electron filling chart to see how these three rules work. According to rule number one, we have to fill the lowest energy level first. According to this diagram, it is 1s. And according to rule number 2, 1s can only hold a maximum of 2 electrons. Making sure one electron is spinning up while the other electron is spinning down. The next energy level or orbital that we have to fill is 2s. Again, with a maximum of 2 electrons, each spinning opposite to each other. Following 2s are the three suborbitals of 2p. According to rule 3, remember to singly fill each suborbital. Have we got enough electrons to pair these three single electrons up? Yes. Fill 2p with six electrons. The next orbital to be filled is 3s, taking on a maximum of two electrons. After 3s is filled, the next set of electrons will go on to fill the orbitals of 3p. And with the remaining electrons, two of them will go on to fill the orbital of 4s while five electrons will singly occupy the five suborbitals of 3d. Then another five will go on to pair up with these five electrons in 3d. And finally, the six remaining electrons will go on to fill the three orbitals of 4p. And that is how the electrons would arrange themselves within Krypton, according to Schrodinger. The same rules and method apply when drawing the electron configuration for something a little more simpler, like phosphorus. Or even more simpler, oxygen. And if you're lazy or effortly challenged, you could just write the electron configuration for an element, as seen here for krypton, phosphorus, and oxygen. <laughs>